We're going to begin with this. The newest coronavirus outbreak could reach its peak at the same time that President-elect Biden is sworn in. That's according to one former FDA commissioner. Mr. Biden calls this pandemic one of the most important battles he will face. Yesterday, he and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris announced a 13-member COVID advisory board to prepare his administration's response. The president-elect vowed to follow the science and urged Americans to put aside political differences and please wear a mask. The goal of mask wearing is not to make your life less comfortable. It's to take something or take something away from you. It's to give something back to all of us, a normal life. The goal is to get back to normal as fast as possible. Joining us now is a member of the president-elect advisory board. That's Michael Olsterholm. He's director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy at the University of Minnesota. Good to see you, Mr. Olsterholm. A lot of people are excited to hear you were on the board because you're known as a straight shooter who pulls no punches. People think you're a great addition. So thank you for taking the time. Thank well, you. What's the, thank advis you. what's the advisory board's goal at this particular moment? Well, obviously, it just formed yesterday, yes. uh, and so we're still working that out. But I'm very encouraged that uh, uh, President-elect Biden and uh, Vice President-elect uh, Harris are really looking at the v really critical issues around how do we stop this virus now, what can we do, how do we tr make the transition to vaccines. And so I, I think that the uh, uh, it's going to offer a lot of uh, good information for how cities, states, and counties can really move forward on their own. Uh, without any other federal leadership, are you encouraged that uh, are you encouraged that they said up front they're going to pay attention to the science? Yes, and and I think that that has been clear for months in terms of listening to the discussion about this is that science has to run the day, and I think that that's what's going to happen here. And I'm very encouraged. I'm encouraged by the other uh, members of the task force. I think that they really are outstanding colleagues uh, who can bring a great deal to the table. So I'm very encouraged. Mr. Osterholm, uh, we've seen a surge in cases, a surge in hospitalizations in this country. In Europe, they've had to go back to lockdowns in some cases. Do you see that possibly happening here again? Well, I, you know, first of all, if you interview 50 people, they'll give you 75 different definitions <laughs> of what a lockdown is. Yes. Yeah. Well, and and that's one of the challenges we <laughs> yeah. have. And, you know, uh, I think that there's no question that our hospitals are about to be overrun. We're going to see by far the darkest days of this pandemic between now and next spring when vaccine becomes available. Uh, you know, uh, on Labor Day, we are at 32,000 cases a day in this country. Uh, now we're running it in the 120 to 130,000 cases a day. Do not be at all surprised when we hit 200,000 cases a day. Our why, hospitals why is are already that happening? overrun. Why is that happening that the cases are jumping so quickly and so in such great number? What are we doing wrong? Well, you, uh, you know, Gail, we have a perfect storm coming together. We have pandemic fatigue. People who mm -hmm. were distancing themselves from others for months who have just decided, you know, I kind of am done with it, uh, even though the virus isn't done with them. We have a group we, I call pandemic anger, up to a third of the population that believes this pandemic is still a hoax and that it's a politically motivated activity. Then you pile that all together with indoor air, where basically we're bringing people indoors much more. We know transmission is enhanced. You know, an average house will basically recirculate its air about once to, uh, to two times an hour. Whereas if you're in a hospital, it's 12 times an hour. And so that you see virus accumulated in homes. So when you have a, a dinner, like a Thanksgiving dinner, it's not un, unusual to see transmission of one person to 5, 10, 15 people in that home. Add that all up together right now, and that's what's happening. We just are not taking this virus seriously. Mr. Osterholm, uh, when you say hospitals will be overrun, mm -hmm. I'm particularly concerned because distribution of the vaccine, when it's available, will come in part through hospitals. Is there a worry that the resources of hospitals could be tied up with treatment and not have uh, the wherewithal to actually uh, work on the prevention with vaccination? You know, I couldn't have said it any better. You nailed it. We're very concerned about that. You know, we need to get vaccine to our health care workers. We know already in this country that upwards of almost 1,500 health care workers have died as a result of COVID-19. Uh, now, not all of those acquired it at work, but many did. And so, yes, we are very concerned about the shortage of staff now just to treat patients than to try to overlay the vaccine issue, even within the health care setting itself, is going to be a challenge. So in your view, what does this administration need to do right away? 
Well, first of all, we have to understand that Operation Warp Speed has been a remarkable effort in terms of bringing vaccines forward. I give them great credit for that. But there still are huge challenges in how to distribute it. Remember, this vaccine has to be kept at minus 94 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 94. We don't have refrigeration operations like that out here. And there have been very few resources provided to states and local health departments to go beyond the initial planning. Uh, you know, we at uh, the public health world out here are concerned about the planning that the military is bringing forward as if by touted by many as the answer, when in fact, in many cases, we're concerned as part of the problem. And so I think that there are going to be huge disconnects trying to get the vaccine out into the communities. And then finally, we've got to get these communities convinced they need it. You know, we're seeing data right now suggesting 50 to 75 percent, particularly in our communities of color, uh, are not at all w willing to take the vaccine because of concerns for safety. We have a lot of educating to do before we're going to see people transfer a vaccine to a vaccination. All right, Michael Osterholm, always good to see you. I'm sure we'll be seeing you again. Good to see you. Thanks a lot. I hope so. Thanks, Gail. All righty.